If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions. Hello to everyone. Um, my name is Anna Osipchuk. Uh, I'm Research Director at School for Policy Analysis and Kiev Mohila Academy, and I'm very happy to welcome everyone to our next installment in our wartime series, uh, which we prepare together with the um, Alumni Association of Kiev Mohila Academy and uh, Kiev Mohila Academy uh, as an institution with the support from uh, Justus Liebig uh, University at Gießen. And uh, in this series, we reflect uh, at the uh, war and everything that's happened to us and to the world around, around us since February 24 and uh, since the uh, full-scale Russian aggression. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy to uh, to uh, discuss the war as human experience with Volodymyr Yermolenko, and that is yes, our second attempt to actually discuss uh, uh, this topic. Uh, the first one didn't work because of the outage and blackout, so I very much hope that uh, we will all stay uh, online uh, and connected today. And um, uh, Volodymyr Yermolenko is Associate Professor of Kiev Mohila Academy, my colleague at the university, and he is also a philosopher, uh, Chief Editor of Ukraine World, uh, analyst, uh, Analytic Director of Internews, and uh, I also uh, can, uh, uh, can name some books of his, on, uh, for example, on um, fluid ideologies, and also uh, the author and of cult pod podcast, and I think that that is probably also uh, uh, an important factor that where you've been able to see him. Uh, and uh, I'm also happy to um, have today Valeria Koroblova, uh, who is the associate professor and uh, uh, also philosopher at uh, Charles University. She is also a holder of Ukrainian chair. Uh, Ukrainian Studies Chair at uh, International uh, School uh, Institute of International Studies at Charles University in Prague. So Valeria will be commenting today on Volodymyr's lecture. Um, so uh, without any further delays, Volodymyr, please let let me pass the well, the floor to you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. I hope you can see and, and hear me. And uh, indeed, I will try to share with you my thoughts about what does the war mean as a human experience. And, uh, but also, I would, I would share some things that uh, I see, I hear, uh, but also some of my conclusions, uh, maybe philosophical or geopolitical conclusions. Uh, but first, first, let me tell you what I'm doing actually right now, because uh, Ukraine is a very interesting place it's not only a very tragic place right now it's not a very courageous place right now it's not only a place where we talk about the war all the time but it's also a place of a big transformative power people transform themselves people turn into some somebody different i think this is something which makes our big difference with russians and currently uh, that Russian regime is a regime which is unable to change. Uh, Putin is a ruler who is actually the same as he was when he took power, a KGB officer, a cruel, cynical KGB officer. Whereas Ukraine is a, is a place where people can live different lives through the, throughout their lifetime. When people can be university professors but then go to the front line, when people can be students of literature, but then become, become a paramedic on the, on the front line, when people can suddenly change professions. And of course, when, when people can face 
huge blows and huge tragedies and, and huge, huge losses. And uh, I think this is very important to reflect upon Ukraine in this way as well. Sometimes we have this proverb among the people who are dealing with humanities in Ukraine that Ukrainian culture is not so much interesting uh, with uh, its products, with the texts, for example, but with the lives of these people, of biographies. Uh, of course, I'm, I do, do not agree that it is not interesting with the text. It's, it's, it has a fantastic, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic heritage that we are now rediscovering: texts, paintings, sculptures, music, uh, music pieces. But at the same time, it's it's indeed remarkable that biography of any Ukrainian writer, philosopher musician is in itself a fantastic story which which lots of twists and with lots of changes and uh, i i do hope that many of such biographies will be written when i'm talking about the war as a human experience you will see in the title of the lecture that i will try to to to, to speak about ukraine about russia and about the world about humanity but the very concept of experience for me is it's important because I'm a philosopher, and usually philosophers do very abstract thinking. So they're reading books, they're launching theories, they are they're making arguments. But my life uh, is uh, from 2014, uh, from 2013, I would even say, from the second Maidan, from the Euro Maidan, from the third Euro Maidan, actually, if we count, from the 1990 has turned into a kind of a mixture between philosophy and journalism. And therefore, I'm doing lots of journalistic work right now. And uh, in a way, journalism and philosophy are two quite extreme professions in the humanities. Because journalism is uh, something that you focus on events here and now, and uh, what is happening here and now. And philosophy is focused on something which is happening everywhere and always. But uh, in a sense that that, that gives a, a very interesting a very interesting lens, a very interesting perspective to, to, uh, to see this war and to look at this. So we're traveling a lot across Ukraine with my wife Titano Harkova, with members of Pan Ukraine, a Ukrainian writers and human rights organization, with, uh, with my colleagues from Ukraine World and from Internews Ukraine. And uh, you can follow our website, ukraineworld.org, in which we publish lots of stories of people, those who suffered from the war, those who went to the front line, those who just in evacuated in a very, very harsh circumstances. Uh, we are also doing lots of work on Twitter, for example, from these places which were hit by this war. We're trying to talk to, to many people. And one conclusion that I make as a philosopher, is that the word, uh, the, the word experience is very important. Experience is something that you live through. Experience is something that, you, that made your life transform itself. And uh, we can say, of course, that Ukraine is right now very united in its, in its resistance. It's remarkable how it is united. It's remarkable how we feel ourselves as a part of a big collective body, and um, like uh, I give this metaphor of these blood cells, like erythrocytes, who are just transforming, transferring oxygen from one part of the body to another. But at the same time, I, I think we also should realize that this experience can also be divisive, not only unifying. Because if we, when you talk, when we went to the Kharkiv Oblast recently, we went to the village called Bezruki. We talked to a, a woman who lost her daughter and her granddaughter in one single day. And her granddaughter, who is called Rita, was, uh, he, she was eight years old. She was reading a book on her courtyard. And then there was a, a Russian cluster bomb who fell on the courtyard and uh, killed this little girl uh, with, with one second. And if you, when you listen to this woman who's called Allah and she, she's telling her story and she's unable not to cry, of course, 
and um, this is just uh, this is very hard to listen uh, and very hard to be there and very hard to write about this so is this experience is it divisive or unifying the ones one one thing it is unifying because it, it increases our empathy towards each other it increases our feeling of fragility of life but at the same time such experience such horrible experience are never transferable we will never be in this unless we feel the same uh, and and people who do not have this experience they can pretend we can pretend we understand we can pretend we are listen but very deep inside this experience uh, remains uh, intimate and non-transferable and uh, i think this is this is a big question also for for the society which is in war, for the society which will come back from the war to a peaceful life, of course, we all believe in this, that after our, our victory we will be in, in a peaceful life. But the real question, one, one of the real question is, if this, if this experience is non-transferable, how can we communicate? How can we ensure that people who were on the front line lost their brothers and sisters because this is all about brotherhood and sisterhood on the front line. How these people will be able to tell their story to those people who are not on the front line, who will probably be as patriotic as those people on the front line, who will be probably helping the army with all their means, but they, they would not have this experience, this suffering or this feeling of victory or this feeling of brotherhood or something else. And I think that this, the question of how we will talk with each other, how we will try to go across this, this, uh, these holes in our experiences, this, how we try to bridge them, is a very, very, a very important question for the society. Actually, the society after the, this war should be able to speak and to listen and to hear, at least in this way. This experience is not transferable, but at least or at least it, 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 it should be a, a subject of, of talk. At the same time, of course, we can, we, can, we can say that the whole communities are formed by a certain experience. And the way how the experience formed this community is very important. I think, by the way, that one of the problems of the Russian society is that they pretend they have the experience that unify them. And this is, of course, the experience of the Second World War. But actually, inside the society there is a big hole of this unifying experience they actually cannot share share with themselves share it with themselves therefore it's it's a, it's a, such a kitschy practice of the immor immortal battalion and all this stuff which then turned into this uh, absolutely crazy and criminal thing which is russian invasion of ukraine but this uh, this idea that there is a lack uh, of of a common experience is of course the the, the 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 idea that makes big troubles inside a nation, inside a community. So Ukrainians, on the one hand, we will be and we are already unified by this war experience, but at the same time, they can be invisible, and there are already invisible cracks. They can that can make our community, our big community, with this big experience that we have turn into an amalgam of the little experiences or well, little not not in the sense of the scale but little i mean in the sense of the, their plurality and how we uh, will be able to put them together again that's that's a very very important thing now let me turn to these three uh, big topics and of course i will be very brief because we don't have much time as as always so what does this war tell us about ukraine i think it tells us about ukraine what history of ukraine tells us for many years and decades the first thing is that ukraine as a political community was formed and understood itself inside the european uh, tradition of the republican political thinking and when i say republican political thinking i'm actually meaning this idea of republic, res publica, common thing, things that we share, that implies that 
there should be no monopoly on power. Republic opposes itself to the tyranny. And uh, the problem of Eastern Europe is that it is associated in the world with Russia and with Russian Empire. If you look at the maps or if you look at the discourse of the 19th century, uh, you will say that the concept you will see that the concept of Eastern Europe is identified with Russian Empire. But I think this is a big, big problem inside this because uh, Russian Empire, the history of the Russian Empire is just a tiny history of the history of Eastern Europe. If we dig deeper into Eastern Europe, you will, we will see such countries as Rech Pospolita, the Lithuanian, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. We will see the very interesting statehood, Cossack Ukrainian statehood, uh, which was called the Zaporozhian host, Visko Zaporizhia which we now call Hitmanshina. You will see a very interesting statehood of Crimean Hanat. You will see deeper in history uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Then you will see the Rus, which was not at all an empire or the origins of the Russian Empire, as Russian history tries to present it, but which was rather, as a Ukrainian historian of the 19th century, Mykola Kostomarov, told us a kind of a federalist entity, at least we can say pluralist, very pluralist entity, which is not subject to one single rule, which was, of course, very, very feudal in its nature, but it was very pluralistic. And this is what I would call re Republican tradition, the tradition that there is no monopoly on power, and when there is a tyrant, uh, we rather oppose this tyrant together. Uh, I think that if, if we dig into this Republican tradition in Eastern Europe, we will see that it has very deep roots. And currently what Ukrainians are trying to do is bring back this Republican tradition, political tradition in the Eastern Europe. I consciously do not call it democratic tradition. If you want, we can discuss it, why I'm using the word Republican rather than democratic. It has nothing to do with American elections, by the way. Of course, it, it has something to do with the philosophical uh, concepts. Uh, but uh, it's obviously that it's obvious for me that the big element of this tradition is the anti tyrannical vision of politics. And uh, basically, what we are witnessing right now is how Ukrainians are showing that they are intolerable towards tyranny. The second thing is that uh, what it tells us about Ukraine is the concept of regeneration. I actually uh, wrote a lot about it in my book, Liquid Ideologies, which is published in Ukrainian, which was based upon my French uh, doctoral dissertation. Uh, and, and there I touched upon this very important concept for the 19th century, which is the concept of palingenesis regeneration. 19th century political theories were thinking in terms of history as a kind of a cycle of regenerations. When one culture dies, it gives a certain element, a certain wisdom, a certain drive, a certain energy to another culture. And this another culture regenerates um, import, some important things which were in this previous culture. And this uh, idea of regeneration was very important for the Romantics. Uh, uh, for the Polish Romantics, for the French Romantics, for the German Romantics, and for, you, for the Ukrainian Romantics. And uh, this explains why, for example, Ukrainian anthem has these words, Ukraine hasn't yet died. Uh, it's precisely this idea that even though we are going through very harsh sufferings, even though some people might think that we are dead, uh, we will regenerate ourselves. We are, we are kind of a collective phoenix. So the important thing for Ukrainian culture is that this metaphor of the collective phoenix, of the regeneration, is not a metaphor. It's something much deeper. Uh, it, it, it can be explained with the fact that Ukraine uh, was a society for a very long time which didn't have its state. So it needed to have some structures to... Uh, regenerate the, the past experience to keep it in the culture despite the oppression, despite the efforts of extermination. Uh, sometimes we ask ourselves how Ukrainian language has uh, survived after 
half of the century, almost half of the century of the ban in the Russian Empire, after the linguicide in the social uh, uh, Soviet Union, how so many traditions of Ukrainian folklore have, have survived and now are basics for Ukrainian folk music. But interestingly, if you look, for example, at, at those people who we consider as fathers of our contemporary literature, these romantics like Taras Shevchenko, Pantel and Monkulish, you will suddenly understand that they perceive themselves as archaeologists, as ethnographers, as some, somebody who dig very deep in, in, into the past and somebody who would try to keep the old stories for, for example, for Shevchenko, it was the stories of the Cossack Dome or about the Heidemark movement or whatever, of the peasant revolts of the 18th century and how they try to, to keep it alive. That's the, something that they, they, they were seeing their, their greatest mission. And this is something that I think if you look at today's war and the way how Ukrainians resisted reviving in the memory all these images of the Cossacks, all these images of the resurgent army of the Second World War, this shows us how this remarkable, it's, it's remarkable how Ukraine as a political community is able actually to go through Actually, death. Uh, when we talk about death, we're talking about Holodomor. We talk about the extermination of the intelligentsia in the 30s. We recently uh, were talking about the anniversary of uh, killings in Sandarmor, where in 1937, in several days or in, even in one day, there was uh, hundreds of Ukrainians, Ukrainian uh, artists, writers, intelligentsia killed. In, in, in Gulag, in, in, in the Soviet camps. So despite all that, there is this more movement of regeneration of polygenesis. And this is something that is, is very remarkable. The second, the third, actually the third thing is that Ukrainians, I think they also, we are also now looking at history in a, in a, in a bit different way uh, compared to to the way how, for example, Western societies are looking at it. We're not looking at history as a linear progress. We're rather looking at history as a cyclical, some, some, something cyclical, a history that repeats itself, repeats both in joys and tragedies. And uh, in this way, I think we Ukrainians think in very different, very, I mean, very close terms with the ancient Greeks. Ancient Greeks also were very skeptical about the idea of progress they were actually thinking in terms of cycles. Their greatest thinkers, uh, you can say that this is cycle, cyclical thinking of history is a very mythological, but it's, it's not because the greatest thinkers of ancient Greece and Rome, and when I'm talking about politics, I, may, I mean Aristoteles and Polybius were thinking in, about politics in the cyclical terms. And they were saying actually that Democracy, however, or politeia, as actually Aristotle called it, however good it might be, is never eternal. It can actually uh, degenerate, it can turn into something much worse, and finally it will turn into the tyranny. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a, if you look, if you, if you read Aristotle in that way, you understand where Trump comes from and uh, why it is necessary to read Aristoteles or Polybius or even Machiavelli, because this idea goes up to Machiavelli to understand what's going on in the, in the Western democracies. In this way, I think Ukrainians, at least myself as a Ukrainian philosopher, have had, uh, much more uh, the cyclical, cyclical vision of history. And cyclical vision of history shows us that the evil can come back, that um, their moral progress is, a, is, a, is, is, is under the question mark. We can never be sure about the moral progress, but I will try to develop on this a bit later. And the last thing I, will, I would like to tell you about Ukraine is that I think that any sound society is based upon two pillars. One pillar I would call it a warrior ethos. Another pillar I would call a, 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 a bourgeois ethos. Uh, the warrior is, ethos is exemplified in the metaphor of Agon in, in ancient Greece, the place where you fight, the, the place where you struggle. The bourgeois ethos, 
is of the bargaining ethos or the consensus ethos is based upon the metaphor of agora uh, a marketplace a place where you talk where you exchange uh, where you seek compromise so my conviction is that the sound society can never be based only on one this or one of these pillars if it is based only upon the idea of ago the warrior ethos well actually this is something that totalitarianism of the 20th century tried to achieve uh, in fascism in nazism partially in stalinism when they tried to make it's particularly in fascism, I think, in the Italian fascism was like this. That the society should all be based upon warriors and uh, those who are seeking compromises as just unnecessary cowards. So you end up in a society in which uh, war is, uh, you, will, you, will, you have a society of war of all against all, of when you consider any opponent as a kind of an enemy. But at the same time, if you build a society upon the idea of agora, the infinite, the place for dialogue and for compromise, you will end up in, in an idea that there are no red lines, that you can achieve compromise with everybody, including with dictator, with Putin, and even with the devil, uh, something very, very bad. And I think that in European societies, primarily the European societies after the Second World War, will were, were kind of a prisoners of this illusion that you can build a society only upon the idea of an inf infinite dialogue, only as an infinite marketplace, only as an infinite agora. I think this is wrong because at any point, point you will face a situation when there is somebody who would come to your agora, pretend he or she is a part of it, but whose only motivation, sole motivation, would be to destroy it. And this is what Russia did, for example, starting from the early 2000s and primarily from the mid 2000s. And this is what Ukrainians were telling to the whole world that, look, you, can, you cannot go into compromise with Putin. You cannot uh, seek infinite dialogue with him. You can actually challenge him. You should actually challenge him. You should stop him. You should uh, respond in the language of force with the warrior ethos. So the warrior ethos is always necessary when you see a certain limits to the bourgeois ethos or to the consensus ethos. And I think, I hope that Ukraine is now showing to the world that this balance is needed. The balance between the consensus, the time when, when you should talk, the time when, when you should seek compromise and uh, a battle, a time when you should fight. Now let's turn to Russia. What does this war tell us about Russia? The first thing uh, is that Russia is a continental empire. First thing, Russia is an empire. Uh, is a cruel, uh, horrible, inhumane empire, the last empire of Europe. And uh, in turn, international observators, I think they were blind to the fact that Russia is not a nation state. Uh, and they were blind to the fact that Russia has never been actually a nation state and never tried to be a nation state. The very idea of Russian statehood is based upon the idea of the 15th century idea of the third Rome, that Moscow should be a third Rome after the fall of Constantinople. And uh, this very idea shows us that Russia has never thought of itself as a nation state because empire thought, I think, always think globally uh, they're not thinking locally. They don't care about the locality, about the uh, the uh, peculiar things about the, the locality. They try to erase localities, to copy-paste empire everywhere. And uh, we see uh, one way of looking at the Russian history is uh, to see how this imperial myth was reinventing itself depending on the circumstances, adapting itself to the circumstances. So it was based upon the very crazy apocalyptic idea of the Third Rome in the 15th century. Then, during Peter I, it needed to modernize itself. And the modernization element in the late 17th, early 18th century was the idea of the centralized, centralized state. This is what Peter tried to do. Then it was modernized with Catherine, uh, with the idea of the certain enlightened monarchy and 
some Western intellectuals as Voltaire were stupid enough and uh, corrupt enough to believe that Russian Empire is actually an enlightened monarchy. Then during the 19th century, when the idea of nation came, uh, it was actually presenting itself as an empire which is a, a product of one nation. And here we have this absolutely crazy and as we now see criminal idea of the three united nation between Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians. But then uh, when the 20th century came, this idea, this empire, imperial idea reinvented itself in the form of the Marxist uh, theory. So it's important to look at this uh, country as an empire. And it is also important to look at it as the empire who is falling, uh, who is... Uh... In Ukraine, you know, we have this phrase that Russia uh, napala na nas, ona vpala na nas. We have this play of words. Russia has not invaded Ukraine, has not only invaded Ukraine, it fell upon Ukraine. Uh, it is really a falling empire, a decadent empire, which, which seeks its glory in the past. It does, doesn't really look in the future. It doesn't really understand its place in the world. It's, it's, it's trying to reinvent always its place in the world, uh, always, lo uh, always uh, using Western wars and Western ideas to oppose to the West. Uh, but why I'm saying that this is a falling empire? Because if you look at the 19th century, you will see that the key eastern territory of this empire, uh, the key western territory of this empire was Poland. And the question about Poland was the key question of the 19th century. The regaining of Polish independence was the key, and uh, Polish statehood was the key question of the 20th century. And as we know, as well know, Russia and Germany tried to undo uh, this question, undo the Polish independence by dividing Poland again in 1939. And uh, in this way, it's important that when Poland got its independence from the Russian Empire, the Russian Empire under some European influences, including Ukrainian influences, intellectual influences, tried to reinvent itself as a kind of a federation. So the idea of the Soviet Union in the 20s, 1920s, was the idea of a certain quasi-federation. Then Stalin un undone it and turned the, this uh, empire again into a very centralized, very cruel empire. So we can read now history of what is going on. In, in a way, Ukraine is now playing the role which was played by Poland in, 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 uh, in, in the 20th century. It's preserving, it, preserving its independence, but um, by preserving its independence, it sends the message to the other colonized subjects of the Russian Empire that they can be free too one day. And Russians understand it very well. Russians understand that if they do not conquer Ukraine, if they do not destroy this Ukrainian spirit of freedom, the decomposing element, the decomposing force will go deeper into the Russian Empire, into what we call now Russian Federation, which is basically a fragment of a much bigger Russian Empire. So Russian Empire was much bigger in the 19th century than it was in the, in the 20th century. Uh, it was much bigger in the 20th century than it, was, it is now. And it will, it will be much bigger now than it will be uh, somewhere by the probably mid 21st century. And I think Russians feel it very well. And therefore, this can explain one of the reasons of this war. Another reason is that, uh, as I said, Russia is a continental empire. And that means that there is a very important difference towards the maritime empires, uh, the European maritime empires of the, uh, of the early modern and modern age. The European maritime empires were colonizing the distant people and distant lands. For them, uh, the key... Um, word, the key instrument of domination was the, was the idea of difference. The colonizer was telling the colonized, you are different, you will not be able to be the same as me. Russian Empire is a continental empire, which is colonizing not distant people, but rather those people who are close to it, uh, geographically or even culturally and linguistically. 
So the, the their key instrument of domination is not the idea of differences, is the idea of sameness. They're telling the colonized, you will never be different from us. You will never have a right to be different from us. And I think this was a message that Russians were telling Ukrainians and Belarusians for for many decades and for many centuries, actually. Uh, and therefore, Russian imperialism is very closely connected to the idea of assimilation. Uh, so this uh, negation of the uh, separate nationhood of Ukrainians and Belarusians is, is a very key thing uh, for the Russian imperialism. And we should understand it. We should understand that inside this negation, there is a really a big genocidal theory, genocidal intent to basically to destroy the distinctiveness of uh, these two nations. Um, so uh, this is this is I think this very important element to understand uh, Russia. And when Russia is presenting itself as an anti-imperial force, which is fighting the Western imperialism, of course it's in Ukraine. It's 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 just uh, makes us laugh. Uh, it's it's very funny because we understand how cruelly imperial Russia is, and how it tries to mask its imperialism with uh, with some other ideas, but. Actually, it is unable to do so. Uh, but if we read the European history of the 19th, 20th, 20th century as the big history of de-imperialization, decolonization, there is no reason to believe that this process will not go deep into Russia. And probably this war, and as we all here in Ukraine are convinced, uh, will be will end with Ukrainian victory. This war will also be a big trouble, further trouble for the Russian Empire inside itself. And the last thing about Russia, um, there is a kind of a discussion uh, whether Russia is a fascist state or not. Well, of course, there is a, there are elements of fascism in, in, in Russia. There are obvious these elements of totalitarianism, uh, the idea that uh, everything sh should be hierarchical, the idea of um, one personalized leader. Uh, interestingly, that when Putin was making photos topless, he was clearly imitating Mussolini doing the same in the 1920s. Uh, but there is one difference with uh, 19th, uh, 20th century fascism. The 20th century fascism was the uh, ideology of the young. It was the ideology of the young people. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler were, and Lenin, uh, which is also kind of a fascism uh, out, uh, inside out, uh, were saying to, to the societies, were, were attractive for, primarily for the young people in their societies. They were this, themselves quite young compared to both uh, the ruling class and, by the way, the class that came after the Second World War. This is very interestingly described by Tony Jatt in his post-war. Uh, Russian ruling class is remarkably old. It's old um, biologically, it's old physically, it's old uh, intellectually, it's old emotionally. It's unable to bring energy, it's unable to be energetic, and therefore it is, in my understanding, can be attractive for the youth, but uh, for the young people, but only for those young people who do not think who do not uh, think about their lives. Uh, and in a way, it is extremely opposing to, to, to any idea of youth. I would say that Russia is a Brezhnevism, which tries to be a fascism. It's, it's an old regime which tries to imitate fascism, 20th century fascism, but even is unable to do that. And I think we should also keep that in mind. And when we are thinking about Russia and uh, bringing some strategies, what we should do about it, we should keep that in mind. And the last thing, and actually I need to finish on that, and I will tell you about my uh, ideas, what does this war can, can, can tell us about humanity, teaches us about humanity. There are a few things I would like to share maybe in the next five minutes. The first thing is that we kind of, uh, we have probably been all too blind with this idea of moral progress. 
doesn't mean that I don't believe in the idea of moral progress. Moral progress clearly is there. Uh, when we look at the slavery society of the, of the ancient Greece and the, 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 the very idea of democracy that they had in ancient Greece, uh, which implied that only a certain very limited number of people is, are actually considered as citizens, and this number of people does not include uh, women, uh, does not include slaves, even does not include the Metax, people who are not citizens, who are not born in the, uh, in the polis. We understand that it, this was a very restrictive democracy. When we look at the founding fathers of the, uh, of the United States and we see how many of them were slave owners, we understand that since then, uh, certain moral progress uh, is taking place. When we see the reports how industrial cities, European industrial cities looked like in the 19th century, when we, when we read Dickens or Flora Tristan, we understand that, well, probably there is a moral uh, moral progress. But that doesn't mean that this moral progress is linear. It it all it, it varies, it, it has really very always, very often it has very zigzag-like form, zigzag-like shape. And uh, when people were really thinking and asking us this question, so how do you think this Russian crimes are possible in the 21st century? How Bucha is possible in the 21st century? How Izum is possible in the 21st century? How these tortures that we are facing, the reports of the tortures uh, by electricity, by beating, um, by many other things, how it is all possible in the 21st century? We're replying, why do you think 21st century is better than the 20th century? What made us believe in that? So rather coming back to this, my early idea that probably moral progress is there, probably it is possible, but we should always be prepared for the return of the evil. And when uh, Timothy Snyder was writing his book about the Holocaust, Black Earth, Holocaust as History and Warning, it was very important that he called it warning. I think we, we should really, really read the history of the past atrocities and the history of this war, which will be written one day as a warning as well. The, 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 the second thing I would like to say is that we should be aware of the trends of this world. And unfortunately, these trends are not so far trends to the end of history, to the you know, consolidation of humanity. We will be facing with increasing polarization. And this is something that Russians are very good at. Russians, uh, their technology was to polarize societies. And uh, if you are an American uh, or a British listening to, to this lecture, of course you understand what this technology meant. But I would just tell you that technology of polarizing the society was, uh, uh, was testified well before Brexit or American election of 2016. It was testified in Ukraine in the 2000s. It was testified during the Orange Revolution when the messages were, uh, were sent about this several sorts of people, several sorts of Ukrainian citizens, and they, of, they were, of course, very, very polarizing. But what Russia is doing now is polarization of the world. This is the big goal of Russia, to polarize the world, to persuade everybody that the world is actually divided into parts. There is a Western world and there is anti-Western world. And I think that there is a very dangerous thing and we need to oppose to it with all our means. But at the same time, we should be prepared that some of the strategy will be successful and uh, some of the polarization will take place. And maybe if it's even good in a certain sense for the free world, I would not call the Western world, for the free world, because I have the impression that the free world, the democratic world has lost kind of a sense of life in the, in the, in the past decades, has lost the meaning of life, has lost the meaning of its existence, has lost the self-confidence. And maybe this is because there was not this element of warrior ethos inside it. There was not this element of that the life is struggle and uh, actually sense 
always or often, very often comes when there is struggle. So if we accept the fact that polarization of the world is inevitable or will be, will be there in the coming decades, I think we should also look and seek some positive things about it, some positive things for the free world, some positive things for Europe, some positive, positive things for Ukraine. And the last thing I would like to end on this, well, unfortunately, we should face a situation with this nuclear blackmail, and we cannot actually say whether it's realistic or not. After 24th of February, actually, Ukrainians tend to look in the future and imagine any possible horrible scenario and think about it, because the mistake of many people here was that we did not really practice imagined the horrible scenarios many of us were in kind of a wishful thinking and some illusions that russia will attack ukraine yes but not totally etc etc and our political class was also in these illusions but one thing we should tell us is that with the new with this nuclear weapon with new, with this nuclear blackmail russia is declaring openly that it is the enemy of humanity that it is the enemy of the planet that it is capable and thinking of and imagining a situation when it can put the whole planet the whole humanity into risk of extinction i think it is a very important conclusion however apocalyptic it might sound but we should just be realistic about it and understand that this is a fight against a force that wants to annihilate humanity thank you so much for your attention we'll be glad to answer your questions yeah thank you very much and uh, um, if i may invite uh, valeria now to comment and uh, Tell her thoughts and um, your uh, your thoughts and probably some questions too, please, Valeria. Thank you so much. First of all, thank I want to thank the organizers for having me here and for this very timely initiative of wartime lectures because it is important to reflect on what it all means for all of us. And I want to uh, thank Volodymyr for his sound voice on various platforms and for his sound deeds beyond them and of course for all this very rich uh, presentation today full of ideas i i would probably do it the following way i will share my ideas i will take some nodal points from your presentation and try to uh, turn and twist them a little bit like joining the dialogue on these burning issues and then i will conclude with a with a question. So I, I believe that one of the main lines of your thinking today was about the historical timing. And I would probably think that Ukrainian story is not that much in running cycles, at least as a Ukrainian, I hope so. Uh, but it is about the history which is open, the future which is not given. So, I mean, the entire like war which we are living through is, it is an ultimate disruption and it says us that uh, anything is possible and no teleology is on the horizon because the Western thinking which you are referring to is very much uh, wired towards some linear interpretation of history that it is moving towards some pre-designed goal, be that like moral prog progress or some dystopian future. But maybe it is not the case. And if it is not, then very much depends on moral choices that people are making on a daily basis. And for me, this aspect of our experience of war is very important. When I read the title of your presentation, it made me think about Hannah Arendt and the human condition. And I, I think that her idea, like analyzing the 20th century, was that the veil of civilization is thinner than we used to think about it. And then when some ultimate disruption happens, then some like human nature pops up and reveals its depth. However, this depth is not necessarily bestial one, but it makes me think this of this Nietzschean idea of a human being as a rope between a beast 
and an other man. So basically, um, this experience of war, as you frame it, as you present it, it is the situation or the human experience, then suddenly we do not have the societal shield uh, the, all these prescribed scenarios and institutional designs stop working, and then we need to find some ad hoc solutions here and now. And basically, while making those choices, we can move in either direction. And, sort of, and, and here we have to deal either with pessimistic anthropology or optimistic anthropology, right? Uh, and then we see both examples and, of course, like Russian uh, soldiers in Ukraine and all these atrocities, they show this beastian nature of humans, but also this mortality of Russians exemplified in their atrocities is juxtaposed by this natality uh, of Ukrainians. And I believe that it's simply spectacular how people demonstrate this constructive impulse all the time, like invest in their hopes in the future, how people repair, rebuild their houses, protect every life. So it is it is exemplified in so many cases. And I think that that makes this local story um, resonate with people elsewhere, because we live in a very turbulent world where facing whether the nuclear threat you're referring to or global warming or global inequality, uh, many challenges are on the horizons, unfortunately. Uh, so we can, like each of us can find herself in the position of being forced to make a moral choice without a template to follow. And therefore, this example that we can see that we can not, not only like drop down in the abyss, but we can also invest our hopes in the future. I think that's a very um, nice and illustrative side of this uh, very horrible, of course, story, what's happening in Ukraine. So that would be my first point. Uh, the second one, uh, when we are talking, of course, uh, the recent history of Ukraine is full of examples of courageous and heroic deeds. But I'm not sure if we want to, if we need to call it the warrior ethos because I do not want to fall in the Habermasian trap when he says that Ukrainians are running through these like outdated stages of nation building, demonstrating its outdated uh, heroic ethos. At least what I see there is something different. Like last week we were looking, we had this screening of the documentary Freedom on Fire. And there one uh, protagonist, an artist from Bucha, with the nickname Picasso, and he was like uh, just uh, delivering corpses and burying them uh, on a daily basis. And he was asked, like, what motivated you? Like, why you were doing that? And he said, well, nothing motivated. Someone had to do that, so I did that. And what strikes me that I hear it in testimonies from people um, in many places in Ukraine, that basically it's not like this heroic fascination, but rather um, what I call in my essay to be published soon, the banality of goodness. So people are making moral choices simply because it feels right and, and, and they cannot afford themselves to do it differently. And what is the lesson here, as I see, is exactly um, this embodiment of values in our daily practices, sort of live as you pray. When you mentioned at the beginning that lives and biographies of people in Ukrainian humanities could be more fascinating than their texts, it's precisely about that. So it's not that much about declaring something and keeping a distance from that declarations, but it's about like living through and enacting those like beliefs or those points you are making in your daily life. So liquidating this gap, it is a sort of also a response to this post-truth world, whether in its uh, caricature embodiment in Russia or in a more refined one uh, in the West. And the third point which I want to make, and that would be the closing one, concluding with a question, as I promised, um, Obviously, I mean, we philosophers will like talking about universal things, but uh, in the 21st century, we cannot allow ourselves to speak from nowhere. So we all are coming from some embedded, culturally embedded positions. And, and from this embeddedness, we understand that there are global hierarchies of power. 
of power and knowledge. And Ukraine has belonged a periphery, a much ignored periphery, which finally uh, acquired its voice on the global stage, albeit at a high, at a high price. And I'm asking uh, myself, and I want to use this chance to ask you, um, if we are playing with the post-colonial theory, trying to uh, show to others that the West or the global capital is not the only evil empire, uh, then we should accept that Ukraine is not the only uh, embodiment of goodness, right? Uh, and therefore, if we just have in mind that there is some open future which could be threatening or thriving, and it's up to us to decide who would be our allies and what would be the argument we might find to engage them in this new project of the future, which would not be like the recycling on the past, because as of now, I see that unfortunately, um, our attempts to engage with subalterns or with the global south have very moderate successes. And therefore, and, and as of now, at least as I can see, I see very efficient mobilization against a shared enemy. But how can we find a language of a more sustainable uh, horizontal solidarity across borders towards a shared future? Thank you. Yeah, yeah Volodymyr, well, please. Uh, and uh, if I may remind everyone to please post to your questions in a comment section of our broadcast. But Volodymyr, please. Thank you, Valeria. Fascinating remarks. Uh, and uh, thank you so for, uh, for such uh, in interesting engagement and really fascinating and deep, deep remarks. So let me um, try to re reply to some of them. Uh, of course, about the future, uh, of course, you, Ukrainians, I think we are much more focused on the future than uh, on the than uh, the Russian culture right now. Uh, maybe because, uh, in my point was for several years already, that maybe our chance is that we don't have a golden age. And uh, contrary to many conservative regimes which are now popping up in the world, we can't say, let's make Ukraine great again. Uh, the, the word again is not a very good word for us. Uh, we would rather do something, something, invent something, create something, uh, because we don't feel comfortable with the world, with the word again. Uh, I think that, that that's a very important thing. That's a very important perception of time. We can, for example, enjoy the 90s, like current generation, uh, by the way, the generation of our president is, is issued from the 90s, from this volcanic, chaotic, maybe anarchic 90s. We can seek in, in inspiration in that epoch. Uh, there, are, there were so many interesting things, but I would not say that people like me would say, okay, this is a golden age, we should come back to the 90s. Because it was a very, very difficult time. Uh, we would, I, I'm not sure, well, we, we are rediscovering 1920s. Our writers, our poets, our playwrights, our cultural renaissance, the so-called red renaissance. But I would not say that somebody wants to come back to it. So people take the past as inspiration, but people do not take a past as a model for living. And this is, this is I think, very important. I will come back to your question, of course, about the future a bit later, but then I, now I, I will go through the remarks. About Hannah Arendt and the fragility of civilization, well, I think that you're absolutely right. And in, in many cases, in many ways, we are really in parallel, parallel worlds, I mean, very, very close worlds with what Hannah Arendt was thinking about. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm also running the podcast Explaining Ukraine and uh, in English. And uh, uh, one of the series that uh, we have launched at Ukraine World is, is called Thinking in Dark Times. And when I was talking to people uh, kind of... Uh, uh, looking for counsel, does the, that, does the title sound good? I, I talked to Marcy Shore, um, a philosopher and historian from Yale, 
And she said, but this is this is kind of Hannah Arendt and people in dark times. I said, yes, I didn't, didn't think about this. While uh, this book is, of course, on my shelf and I admired her essay about Walter Benjamin and some other, uh, other things. And you are referring in your banality of good. It's very interesting. You're referring also to, um, to Hannah Arendt. But one thing I would, so one thing I would, I would, I would definitely agree with Hannah Arendt. The two things, actually, uh, how she describes totalitarianism. She describes it as, um, as the feeling of existential loneliness. So when people in a society feel uh, unheard, ununderstood, and lonely, they would rather go for totalitarian force that will that will ensure that will give them certainty and that will uh, replace uh, understanding and horizontal ties with the vertical power and with violence. And I think this is precisely what was happening with Stalinism and what is happening in uh, with Putinism. Uh, and I definitely agree with her and what you said about the fragility of civilization. I think that some good writers and, and, and playwrights and uh, uh, maybe film directors warned us for a very long time that uh, civilization is very fragile. The civilization is not something that oppresses us. We should not be thinking about civilization as uh, in, in a tradition of the leftist thinking that it is something that oppresses us. We should also think uh, about civilization as the product of our deeds and maybe as our baby, which is actually needs protection from us. And uh, uh, it, it's not a horrible monster that oppresses us. It's, not, it's very often a baby which is so fragile that it needs protection from us, from us, the citizens. I think this is very important to realize. And this brings me back to your question about institutions. So we are actually in the philosophical thinking, political thinking between two extremes. One extreme is, we all know about it, this is called voluntarism or decisionism. And this is the, the evil that the Western world was facing for uh, in a, precisely in the 20s and 30s when, when there was this revolt against institutions and when, when there were people who were saying that we don't need these institutions, we need a power, we need a strong hand, we need a powerful actor and the powerful politicians who would just break these institutions and impose the, the will and will be able to decide because institutions, their procedures, they are long, they are soulless, they are inhumane, they are unable to decide. And basically the Western world opposed to this voluntarism, what we might say institutionalism after the Second World War, the idea of procedures, conversations, rules, rule of law, etc. But it appears that it is not an ideal world either, because if we leave everything to institutions and procedures, we will have a situation when it's, it's also inhumane. We will, we will end up in a Kafkian world, Kafkian world of bureaucracy. And um, I've recently had a conversation for, for uh, my podcast with Bruno Massage, whom I think is very interesting thinker, one of the most interesting thinkers of our time. And um, in his book, uh, The Dawn of Eurasia, he describes Europe in a very interesting way. He says that Europe is increasingly trying to be an algorithm. Europe, I mean the European Union, is, is increasingly trying to be an algorithm uh, where everything is decided by a certain number of rules. And, uh, and um, well, this might sound okay, but at a certain moment, it shows you that there is no, no place for human decision. And of course, in the times of troubles, uh, we are coming back to, to human decisions. We need human faces. We need solutions. We need uh, decisions between the alternatives. And uh, the role of the decision, the very word decision, is coming back to philosophical discourse. It's coming back with uh, Timothy Snyder's new book, which will uh, be published next year. It's, it's coming back with many reflections. So I think we, again, we need to come back to, to the balance because we, may, we moved from this voluntarism 
the cult of the personality, we move to the Western world, we move too, uh, too far to this idea of institutionalism and that everything will be decided by rules. No, everything will not be decided by rules. Rules can, of course, help us to make things understandable, make things more uh, predictable and make us live in the same world, in a kind of a more or less similar world, understandable world, but rules cannot decide. Procedures cannot decide. Let's, let's not be naive about this. So, of course, this is a time when we need uh, human persons back and human decisions back in politics as well. Uh, as for the heroism, and when I, I, I agree with you that we can, we, we should not heroize this. I mean, this heroization is something uh, is something that uh, is the most, uh, I think, uh, how to say it. When you go with this heroizing discourse to the soldiers themselves on the front line, they just laugh at it. Of course, they do not perceive it in this way. War is, in many aspects, about very dirty, dangerous, banal, uh, routine, everyday reality. On this, I, I agree with you. But I was not talking about heroes. I was talking about the warriors. And I do not romanticize this word. I don't think that, again, uh, I don't think that if the warrior are ruling the society, this is good. Uh, I think that the, 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 that moment when we have this ideology that the warriors should be ruling the society, that moment we had very dangerous things going on in Europe. Uh, I think that the warrior ethos should be uh, a second pillar compared to this agora, uh, compromise uh, ethos. There should be two two ethics who should be in the society and kind of competing between other between each other. And the warrior is not uh, not necessarily a heroic person. The warrior is somebody that says at a certain moment that I will fight. Uh, I will not uh, talk. As one uh, French writer said, I think it was. Perec, but I, I can be mistaken. I need to ask my wife. Uh, Quelqu'un préfère un, un dialogue intérieur, moi je préfère battre. Uh, somebody prefers an internal dialogue, but I prefer fight. So, uh, and I think the number of these people in Ukraine that are ready to say to themselves, I will fight, is an important factor uh, in, in a capacity of Ukrainian society to resist. So people who are helping, uh, you know, to identify bodies in the morgues are also, I think they are also in this, uh, in this perception. There is nothing, there is nothing romantic in this. Uh, there, is, there, is, there, is, uh, there is something else. There is this feeling that, well, there is no, 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 no place, no time for compromise, no, no time to talk, no time to seek dialogue or whatever else. And I think this is important. This is an, an important counterbalance to this, uh, to this ethos of, of dialogue. But again, if it starts dominating the society, we will have a, a situation of war of all against all. And there is also this virus in Ukrainian society as well. We can see it how sometimes toxic things are in social networks, primarily in social networks, how things are, how people are inventing their enemies. And this is primarily because they want to fight, but they want to fight in the wrong place, in the wrong time against the wrong persons because uh, they kind of uh, absolutize these uh, warrior ethics. They, they exaggerate it, they move it too far. And it is very important, I think, that for Ukrainian society to understand that it is sometimes going too far when you address it against your, your uh, co-citizens and not against your real enemy. 
And my last point about your question, so what is and how to talk with, uh, with other post-colonial cultures, I, I, I have two, uh, two replies to it. The first is I don't really think that post-colonial message uh, will work in other post-colonial cultures. Um, we need to check it. Uh, but this is just a hypothesis. I, I didn't check it. I didn't. I didn't talk too much. Uh, I didn't research it. But my hypothesis is that we are indeed the part of the West. We are perceived as the part of the West by by people who who are skeptical about the West in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and uh, yeah, they might perceive us as you know this uh, part of those people that were cruel to them. And uh, I don't think that if we are saying that, look, we are not only, we're not only friends with, you, with your former oppressors, we are also the victims of another, another oppressor, I don't think that this will provoke any empathy to them, with them. I think that post-colonial message is important for, for other people and in our kind of communication with other people, primarily in the West. In, within those people in the maybe leftist intelligentsia who are considering the West as the biggest evil on earth. Because for me, this is kind of an inversion of their, uh, of the Western domination of the Western primacy, but upside down, upside down, inside out. Because in the 19th century, the West was saying, I'm the only good on this planet. And now these Western intellectuals are saying, I'm the only evil on this planet. And this is kind of also this hierarchy, which is a reverse image of this initial uh, colonialist hierarchy. I think we need to say that, look, you're not the only evil. Maybe you're not even the worst evil. There are other empires, and maybe they're even worse. Currently, Russian empire is definitely worse than the Western empires by the whole fact that it is still existing and still imperialist and it is did not even want to do not does not even want to start a discussion about its imperialism whereas for these post-colonial cultures i think that there might be many people who just want to who just also perceive the west not as an as an oppressor but as a kind of successful social and economical model and uh, in this way, maybe Ukraine should address them as a country which is also trying to build a, a successful social and economical model, which can be rich in technologies, good in education, good in uh, social services, administ administrative services, in the relation between the state and, and the citizen. So this is completely different, different, different area, different field. And I think that it is rather this message that, yes, despite all the strategies, we are actually able to transform ourselves into kind of a normality, into more, more humane relations between citizen and the state, more uh, efficient technology, more interesting and pluralistic economy. Maybe this should be the message, because if we are in this post-colonial message all the time, we are just replay, replaying the, the victimhood narrative. But I think there is a deeper question. I will finish on that. What future should be uh, built? And what future should we be looking for? And um, actually, my point is that we are going increasingly in the 21st century. We will go increasingly away from the perspective of modernity. Uh, you know, the Western discourse still lacks the concept how to, to, to designate the epoch we are living in. And it is always playing with the word modernity. Postmodernity, metamodernity, hypermodernity, whatever. I personally think that it is extremely ridiculous, all this, all this place with the words, because they are actually saying that we, are, we, we cannot invent anything else. We are so dependent on the concept of modernity and with the every new prefix post hyper meta we are actually inside the modernity and our versions of this 
But uh, I would say that why I'm thinking the 21st century will finally go to something different. Because modernity was an epoch where humans were thinking of their relations, of our relations with nature in terms of power. Uh, in traditional societies, nature is an equal subject to humans, maybe even more powerful subject. You will talk to nature, to the environment, let's call it environment, which will include gods, spirits, whatever else, titans, uh, horrible monsters, spirits of the dead. So you're talking to this environment. Sometimes you're fighting against it. Sometimes you're trying to dialect with this, be in conversation with this. Sometimes you're dependent on this. But you're kind of in this subject-subject conversation. In the modern times, uh, the, the, the key thing about modernity was that the human being will be a dominant power over the environment. And uh, environment will be an object rather than the subject. And, um, and everything comes from it, industrialization and then fossil fuels and then how we use our resources, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the Western world is now coming to something different. And it will, of course, be linked with the concept of environment, echo, etc. So I, I, I think we're increasing, we will be increasingly in the concept, which I would call, I don't know if somebody called it in that way, oikonomy, which is kind of combination between ecology and economy. Economy and ecology, as we all know, probably have the same uh, root and come from the same word, oikos, which, is, which means home. Um, and the society which the humanity will be driving to will be a, a, an attempt of a synthesis between traditional society where humans and environment were in subject-subject relations uh, and the modern technology modern knowledge, modern technology, which in a way will help us to reestablish, reestablish the subject-subject relations with the environment. Therefore, for example, international lawyers are now thinking about the new crime which uh, should be in the international law, which is a crime of ecocide. From genocide to ecocide. In a way, what Russians are doing in Ukraine it's also ecocide. <clears throat> They're threatening with nuclear war. They're threatening with um, explosions of a dirty bomb. They're threatening with um, explosions on the Dnipro Dam. They're killing animals, not only humans. They're destroying the uh, zoological uh, zoo parks. This is not only the war against Ukrainians and not only the war against humanity, as I, as, as I said earlier, this is the war against life in a certain way, against biophilia. And uh, maybe this war will also kind of make us rethink the society we are actually heading to. And in this way, Ukrainians, as many other probably nations in the world who were not that deep into modernization drive, and here, I think, we can find a common conversation with the, with the colonized people, not through the trauma, not through this idea of suffering, that we were victims, you were victims, etc., but through the idea what this experience, which very deeply linked to the traditionalist experience, to the experience of traditionalist societies, because they continue to exist kind of a, in opposition to the official culture, which was modernizing, etc., which in this way preserved so much of, this, of its folklore. And uh, Ukrainian folklore is so much intertwined with nature, with environment, with plants, with, with trees, with, with fish, with animals, with 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 gardens, whatever else, you know, we, we, we all know that. And in a way, this can be a, a topic to talk. But another interesting thing is that Ukrainian culture 
is actually never opposed modernity and tradition. All our key dispolygenetic revivals were related in a way that we look into the future, but also look into the past. Our modernist in literature, Lesya Ukrainka, Stefanik, Kotsubinsky, were actually rediscovering tradition through the modernist style and through the modernist approach to literature. We can, we can say that Taras Shevchenko was a modernist traditionalist. We can say that Ukrainian avant-garde is looking to the future, but at the same time playing with the deep past. And probably this is something that is, is really interesting what Ukraine uh, can suggest to the world. And interestingly, in our, in our pantheon of, of thinkers, we have this trend. We have this trend in Skolorada, obviously. We have this trend in our art. We have this trend in, um, in our dissident thinking. People like Mykola Rudenko, who was criticizing Marxism precisely because Marxist theory of the added value was not ecological enough. Because the key added value, according to Rudenko, is not by uh, human labor, but by the solar energy. So lots of different things to, to think about. Uh, Valeria, uh, Valeria, probably you have uh, some. Oh, I will certainly respond to that, but I just I don't want to steal an opportunity for the audience to engage. Yeah, we, we don't we don't have any questions for now, uh, which is strange. Yeah, but probably everyone. I, I mean, that for example, for me, this situation I've been wanting to ask so much, but the way. Uh, uh, when well, then you go on, you kind of touch on what I wanted to ask already. So that's probably partly the reason. So please, Valeria, if you if you have Let's any... Imagine the speaker anticipated all possible questions. Well, um, I should say it's very reassuring to hear that we, we seem to agree on many things, that we are thinking along the same lines. And of course, all these challenges, uh, like you said, it's not only genocide, but also ecocide and herbicide. So we have all these cases that push us to rethink many, um, many fundamental things about our worldview and our attitude to each other, to, to our future and to the nature. And from this perspective, I, I think the sign of today is what Ulrich Beck was saying, that the high modern times were that we were believing where we are moving towards something good, and even if something bad happens on the way, just an epiphenomenon. And now we are in a reverse position that we seem to be moving. At least we see some very alarming signs all across um, the earth and the, the future horizon. But at the same time, we keep the hope that there are some like nice side effects of bad events. And, and this kind of interesting, like reverse catastrophic utopianism uh, is exactly the point when we can look at all these cases of herbicide, ecocide, uh, these threats to biophilia, as you call it, that hopefully it will alarm us all enough to, to devise some good solutions. Uh, from this situation, and uh, and I'm very happy that we touch upon this heroic ethos, because I think that those things should be uh, told through. Because I'm very cautious about essentialization. I would not want to to leave this conversation with the impression that supposedly, like we Ukrainians, are a nation of warriors, and, and uh, Europe is sort of the community of trade men. So let's like teach each other what we know best. So. Uh, so I do like this idea that it's not that much about like iconic archetypal figures, but it's more about some normative orders. And as you say, and as you explain in, uh, in this Q&A session, that is basically about the red lines to cross and it's about the transformation. So even if you do not behave like a warrior all the time, if the time arrives, and you understand that this is the bottom line, that the East is like the stop word for tolerance, because now I need to stand up for what is dear for me. Uh, so this combination of two like normative systems, when there are times for, for negotiations and compromises, but there are situations and people when it is impossible, and then you need to fight. And I think it's very, very important in this context. Um, and also I wanted to, to thank you for your outfit. I like your hoodie. 
I see a little part of it, but I believe it's Kharkiv Zalizobeton, so it's such a nice, like, hello from my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. Thanks for bringing it in the limelight today. Yeah, if uh, if I may uh, kind of observe my writer, the moderator here, and uh, uh, probably add a couple of things and ask also a question, but from perspective of sociologist and uh, a lot of things that you've been mentioning, and actually I, I can see it um, through the data, uh, for example, this existential loneliness that you mentioned, we can see it reflected into in the way how the absence of solidarity and the absence of trust in each other, this in, interpersonal trust, yeah, kind of uh, do not allow people or actually it's also something that is a huge factor in, uh, for example, absence of protest in Russia uh, or absence of any, any collective actions because uh, how can you protest if you do not trust uh, your neighbor to do the same or to help you or do not have a solidarity. So we, we actually see a lot of data here. And uh, and actually one of my, or rather a, a, a main question I have now is, uh, it could be a naive one, a bit naive, but on the other hand, it's uh, uh, what a lot of sociologists actually, um, and including also Russian sociologists, actually mentioned that Russia nowadays is a society without a morality or a moral order. Uh, for example, Valeria mentioned normative order, but here the question, like, uh, uh, some goes, for example, Lev Gutkov goes as, 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 as far uh, as to call it a, a moral society. But on, on the other hand, we also know that society can't exist without and some kind of morality. So actually here, my question for you, do you see any moral order in Russian society, even if it's different or even, or what is your answer to that question? Thank you, Anna. First, uh, about my hoodie. So yeah, indeed, we are very often going to Kharkiv right now. and. Uh, Kharkiv Zalizo Beton, uh, you know, this uh, actually a Kharkiv Dutch prom turned into, um, into a fortress. Uh, I think it's very important to, for Ukrainians uh, to, to rediscover the country and to go from one place to another. And this is that horizontal solidarity which is, which is very needed. And probably the war. Yeah, uh, through all possible tragedies and sufferings also gives us this chance. So for us, this, this is a practice to go to Kharkiv, stay in the apartment of Yuri Shevilov and, uh, and also talk to people in Kharkiv and travel in Kharkiv region. This is a very important practice right now for, for, for us, uh, people in Kyiv. So, Anna, to your question, I don't know, actually, because I'm not a sociologist. And uh, the last time I've been to Russia was 1989. It was still Soviet Union. I was nine years old. So the only thing I know is, is Russian ideology. The only thing I know is philosophical texts, literary texts, and, of course, the Russian propaganda. I can, I can, I can judge upon that. I would not... I would not speculate on the Russian society. So you as a sociologist, if you see data, you know much better than me. And uh, people who are living in Russia know much better than me. My hypothesis is that, indeed, the, uh, the big difference between Ukrainian society and Russian society is that in Ukrainian society, uh, the horizontal uh, connection is much more important than the vertical connection. Uh, we are actually used to live without, uh, without the uh, vertical authority, hierarchical authority. And therefore, when it is absent, we are okay with this. We can live without it. And even more to that, we are, Ukrainians are actually defining themselves as in opposition towards a certain hierarchical authority. Therefore, when the hierarchy of authority was in Moscow, we were always supposed to it. One of the, by the way, one of the challenges of the Ukrainian society would be, and it is already is, is a certain opposition towards Kyiv 
uh, from um, other other regions, other cities. That can can be because it it is in the spirit of Ukrainians, kind of a, to oppose themselves to hierarchy of power and and to the center. And that can be dangerous, by the way. Uh, and that we, we have seen already the trends of it in the late 2010 during the uh, different during the local elections of 20, 2019 of 2020 so this trend is there uh, with the russian society i think it's 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 not in this way maybe it will develop in 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 the next years and decades mm -hmm. but uh, i do think that there is a problem of, re of responsibility the problem of individual responsibility what I see from the uh, Vox Populi by Radio Liberty, I follow, or by uh, current time, I follow it very often, mm -hmm. what people say on the streets, different Russian cities. What strikes me is that the kind of outsourcing of responsibility, they kind of are saying, okay, this is not my decision, I'm not interested in that. But if those people on the top decided that in that way, that means it is correct. So I'm kind of a outsourcing my responsibility i'm erasing my my myself and this is very dangerous but at the same time this is very intrinsically linked into the russian intellectual culture it was always uh, anti-individualistic it was always anti-personalistic one of the most mis biggest misunderstanding in the russian intellectual culture was the personalism by by nikolai berdyaev and I, and I explain this personally with the simple fact that Berdyaev was from Kiev and that Berdyaev uh, liked Skovoroda. And of course, Skovoroda is a very personalistic philosophy because mm -hmm. he's actually saying that every human being has his or her own nature. Russian philosophy, Russian intellectual culture went into completely different things. It went into this idea of all unity as Solovyov, that Solovyov, the philosopher, not the current one. <laughs> uh, the, the, the idea of Siedinstva, then the Marxist idea. So it was all this erasure of the individual differences in, in, into something big, into something uh, collective, into something super individual. And that's a problem for Russians, obviously. That, that's a problem for the Russian society, this lack of individual uh, individual responsibility and we cannot explain it with fear because why then the protesters why there are no protests in russian immigration abroad after the partial mobilization there are so many so many people abroad why why don't we see it i think this is this is precisely this and the second question is that that uh, i think russians who do not like putin actually uh do not imagine another Russia. They cannot imagine what another Russia could look like because they would face very difficult questions. The imperialization of Russia, what does it mean? Does it mean a decomposition of the Russian Federation? Because obviously there will be a problem. There is already a problem. If Russians cannot persuade Ukrainians that Ukrainians are Russians, how they will persuade Bashkirs, Dagestanis, Kalmyks, and uh, Buryats that they are Russians, it will be a much more difficult task. Uh, and uh, so what is what is the vision? If we say, okay, there are Russian liberals, then they should be anti against empire, against tyranny. What, what should be the vision? Is it decomposition of Russia to many different nation states? Or is it the genuine federalization of Russia with kind of, a, I don't know, 20 different re republics each of them having a power center and then they are having a kind of a common institution like in the EU when they take decision by qualified majority or, or something else. I, I don't know whether there are discussions on this in, in so-called Russian liberals. Uh, that means that uh, do they have the alternative vision of Russia or they hope that, okay, Putin will die, they will come back, come to power they will take all the resources and they will rule uh, as 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 Putin did, we, but with uh, with you know with better relations with the United States, Germany, and better better houses in the on the Côte d'Azur, because if the the problem of Russian intellectual culture, for example, the the Russian anarchism, 
the 19th century was that, well, the thing that they have proposed actually was not reform, intrinsic reform of the Tsarist regime, as for example, Ukrainian intellectuals were proposing as Drahman of others, that we should remake the empire in the, in the much more decentralized way. But Russian anarchists were saying, no, 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 we should just kill the Tsar and put a, a good Tsar in, instead of this, this bad Tsar. And this is what happened with Bolshevism, that just killed one Tsar, put another Tsar in its place. So, so yeah, this is, this is a big question for them. Uh, there is a question also for us, we should really care about this. And uh, I th I, I'm sure that there is a little bit too much to ask Ukrainians to think about the future of Russia doesn't really something that should concern us. But I think we should uh, send some of these virus thoughts, virus ideas, because this is important. I mean, OK, there are some Russian liberals abroad or inside Russia. There is uh, this Navalny, who is another Russian imperialist. Under which condition, for example, if Russian regime falls, under which what would be demands from the international community towards Russia? If this is a big demand of regime change, certain liberalization, uh, coming back of Dorj, Terech, Moskvi, this is certainly not what is needed. The true program should be de-imperialization of Russia, either through decomposition or through the kind of a softer word version, which is a genuine federalization without a single center, which would actually mean in the, in the decomposition in, in, a, in a bit delayed perspective. I think that Ukrainians should actually feel the the global discourse with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I uh, I think I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm I'm sure Valeria, you probably will also agree with that. That we have we should have our say in in uh, and propose some ideas and. Uh, uh, we're actually a bit even over the time, and I, I thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, it's been a very interesting and important lecture for me, a lot of food for thought. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you again, and thank you everyone who's been watching yeah. or who will be watching uh, in the record, the recording. So yeah, thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Valeria. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You, if Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive, have no illusions.